My Govan and welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek. And in this video, I want to talk about a matter of interpretation when it comes to Tolkien stories. And part of the reason I want to do this is because I've seen a lot of stuff going around lately about how to interpret Tolkien's works and which approach should be taken. And there's basically two major schools on this point. There's the authorial intent school, and then there's the death of the author school. The death of the author approach basically says that once the author has put the story out there for public consumption, it's no longer relevant what the author intended, what the author wanted. It's completely up, the, up to the reader to pull whatever they want from the story. Authorial intent, on the other hand, says that the intent of the author is still important and should guide, at least to some extent, our interpretation of that author's work. My opinion is more on the authorial intent side of things. And there's a few reasons for that. And in particular with Tolkien, there's his own statements, and then there's kind of the meta arguments that I think apply to basically any given work of fiction. So I'm going to look at both of those, particularly because in the, top, in the context of Tolkien, some of the things that he says have been taken to mean, you know, one or the other approach, and I think that we can kind of rationally explain some of the things that he said don't actually mean death of the author, they mean something different, and also I think what he has said to the extent that it goes either way, the main issue of the meta-argument really is the controlling issue anyway, so at the end of the day I think that's the way we have to go. So I'm going to discuss that and I'm going to show why the discussion is relevant by giving an example. So let's take a look at what Tolkien said first. So one of the main arguments against the authorial intent view is the fact that Tolkien himself said many different things over the course of his life that would seem to indicate that he kinda didn't care what people did with the story. For example, in the foreword to the second edition of The Lord of the Rings, he specifically says, you know, I dislike allegory and I prefer uh, history, true or feigned, with its varied applicability. And he distinguishes allegory and applicability by saying allegory is, you know, allegory is the purposed domination of the author. Applicability lies within the freedom of the reader. So he seems to be arguing here for the idea that the reader can do what they want with the story. He's also said things in some of his letters that seem to imply that what the reader does is kind of up to them. And for example, he was writing, I forget to who, it might have been to a priest, it might have been to one of his friends, but he more or less said that, you know, it's kind of out there for other people. I don't, you know, necessarily feel an obligation to make my story fit 100% with all the details of Catholic theology. On the other hand, he's also got things on record where he'll say, for example, you know, the work Lord of the Rings is a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, subconsciously at first, consciously in the revision. So there's a little bit of a tension there on those terms, and there's also other things. When people ask questions of Tolkien, he would write back in letters where he would explain this is what's really going on or this is the answer to your question or whatever. He's also had a famous exchange with a movie production company because they wanted to make an animated film based on his work and he had some rather specific ideas about how their work was kind of ruining his and why their ideas were total garbage and some of those for example would have been you know, the, they wanted to have the eagles basically transport the fellowship from event to event and not really have them do any walking. <laughs> and Tolkien was basically like, quite apart from being a bad story um, device, that also is just not in keeping with his, you know, the rules of the world he created. So he's got these two different things that he seems to be arguing for, but I think we can explain some of the other statements away by saying when he argues for applicability, he's not saying that you can interpret the story just any way you like. Uh, 
there are still words on the page and they mean something, even if they, you know, their meaning can be taken in more than one way. They can't be infinitely malleable. And when he says applicability, he's talking about the ability to apply words on the page to other things. So, for instance, in his discussion of allegory versus applicability, he refers to the fairly common at the time interpretation that the Lord of the Rings was an allegory for World War II. And he said if, if it had been, the ring, basically, which would have been the atomic bomb, would not have been destroyed by the good guys. It would have been used to defeat Sauron, and, you know, he goes into more detail. But he's pointing out that's clearly not what the allegory, that's that, that allegory clearly doesn't work. What he says is, I prefer history, which is, has multiple, you know, applic you know, multiply applicable. That's not the way he put it. But the idea behind applicability is that you can learn something true from an event which can happen either in real life or in fiction, which can then be applied to other situations, even though those two situations aren't the same thing and they don't mean the same thing. So, for example, Saruman is not an allegory for either Japan or Italy or any other ally of Hitler any more than Sauron is Hitler or Nazi Germany. But Saruman and the way he behaves can clearly be applied to many instances of people in real, real life. And we all know of examples that we could think of in our, you know, modern day even, where we could say, that guy's acting a lot like Saruman. You know, he's got an ends justifies the means approach. He thinks that what he's doing is maybe good in the long run, but he's essentially sacrificing everything that's good in the short run to get it, and ultimately is just going to be totally corrupt. So we can see shades of Saruman in many figures across time and history and apply it in that way, but that's not the same as saying that Saruman is meant to be any one of those things. So. I don't think when Tolkien is saying applicability is within the freedom of the reader that he's necessarily saying you can interpret the story however you want, it doesn't matter. He's saying that because, you know, the, the story is a history and therefore in a sense a true story, because all histories in some sense are true even if they're made up histories because that's kind of his view of myth is that they're all true, you just have to see the truth behind the literal words on the page. There was no actual hobbit named Frodo who actually walked a ring to Mordor and threw it into a volcano, but the kinds of things that happen in this story are true to human nature. They're true to things that we know in the world. Just like any good fairy story is going to be true to something in the real world that we can recognize. So Tolkien is showing that the while the story may not be factually accurate, it contains truths, and those truths are applicable widely. But this in itself implies that there are, in fact, truths which, you know, Tolkien himself would recognize, even if he didn't intentionally plant there, which would necessarily imply that there are also untruths which are not in the story, because Tolkien you know, for example, if he's going to say that his work is fundamentally Catholic, he's not going to say that murder is okay or that, you know, human sacrifice is fine. And we, you know, you can see from the story of the Akalabeth and the downfall of Numenor, human sacrifice happens, and Tolkien is clearly against it because, you know, I mean, being a Catholic, he's not going to agree with any of those things. And most of the, you know, modern world would also agree that those things are all horrible, but the point remains, Tolkien would even have more specific and, you know, not to say idiosyncratic, but more specialized views than even that because of his Catholic faith. There are certain things that he's going to think are true, which he's not going to put in the story. He's not going to put anything in The Lord of the Rings that he thinks is directly contrary to fundamental aspects of the Catholic faith. That's just a fact. I don't, I don't think we can get around that. Now, of course, the question is, why should we care what Tolkien thinks if we're not even going with the authorial intent view? So, you know, if, if we want to take the view of the death of the author, 
what difference does it make what Tolkien thought? That's kind of irrelevant by definition. Here's where we get into the meta-analysis. So the meta aspect of the whole approach of whether you go with death of the author or authorial intent comes down to the question of fundamentally what is a story and what is really anything in textual form. Ultimately it's all a sort of communication and when we're talking authorial intent or death of the author we're talking about interpretation. And interpretation has a very specific meaning. It doesn't mean what the story makes me feel. When we talk about interpreting something, we're talking about what it means. And what it means is to some degree an objective inquiry. That's not something that's just about what I like or what I seek to find in a story. For example, there are things in Lord of the Rings which I think point to aspects that I surmise are views of Tolkien that I don't necessarily agree with. I've done a, a video before, I think it was my Tolkien on politics video, and you can literally just find it, that's the title of the video, um, and I can link to it below, but he, I talk about the some of the stuff that happens in the scouring of the Shire and some of the things that are said that make me think that Tolkien, and the fact that he's Catholic kind of supports this, might have been a distributist, and distributism is just a, it's a, it was a conceived of as a third way between capitalism and communism. Uh, other famous proponents of this would have been Hilaire, Hilaire Belloc and G.K. Chesterton. Um, I don't know that Tolkien espoused this particular economic theory, but some of the things that are said by his characters in the Scouring of the Shire chapter make me think that he at least leaned in that direction. I don't necessarily agree with that view in, in economic terms. I don't necessarily think that that's the best economic system, but that doesn't change the fact that that's what I think Tolkien had in mind. And that is not to say that I think Tolkien was trying to preach at us in terms of, you know, making a statement of what his views were. I don't think he was consciously doing that. I think Certainly, at some level, his views are expressed by various characters in the story, such as the Hobbits, the good ones, and Faramir particularly, because Faramir even says in one of his letters is the character most like him. But the fact of the matter is, when I read the words of those Hobbits, whether or not that's actually Tolkien's view, what I'm getting out of that is that something like what the hobbits in those passages are saying is something like what Tolkien thinks of as a more ideal system than whatever it was Saruman imposed prior to the scouring. So interpretation ultimately is about finding out what the story means regardless of what you like or don't like. I don't think the the inquiry of what an author means or what a story means has anything to do with what we want to find in the story. It's about what is in the story. So the meta argument here has to do with the fact that the intent is relevant to that because that's what ultimately decides what the thing means. And the reason it decides what the thing means is because all communication is ultimately given its meaning by the communicator. When we interpret the word interpret comes really through the prism of interpreting or translating other languages. An interpreter is one who tells you what somebody else means. And it's not about telling you what that interpreter wants to think or wants you to think. If the interpreter is doing their job, they're just conveying the meaning of the speaker or the writer who is in a different language or whatever to the person who doesn't understand it. So the interpretation is, by definition, seeking the meaning that was intended by the communicator. So just like I'm sitting here and talking, you know, into a camera so that people can hear me on YouTube or a podcast or whatever it is, I'm in the position of conveying what I mean. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to do it perfectly and it doesn't mean that everybody's going to understand me the first time around. But what I'm saying is an attempt by me to convey my meaning to other people. And 
at bottom, that's all communication ever is. And I don't see any reason to treat fictional stories any differently than anything else. Now, there's a caveat to that because fictional stories are not like, for example, careful logical argument in the sense that I'm not trying to, you know, a fictional story is not trying to lay out, well, with some exceptions, careful logical arguments that lead specifically from one proposition to the next in a, you know, a line that gets you to a conclusion at the end. There are fictional stories that do that sort of thing, and those are allegories. Good examples of allegory would be like Alice in Wonderland, which is a satirical allegory about politics in the United Kingdom uh, during the time that Lewis Carroll was alive, or The Pilgrim's Progress, written by John Bunyan to, you know, give an idea of what he thought was, you know, the Christian life and how it plays out in various ways. The Pilgrim's Progress is a much easier version of that because the characters are literally called what they are. I mean, you've got characters named Faith. You've got a giant named, oh, the name escapes me now. I forget what the giant's name was, but it was something bad. And then you've got, you know, characters named Charity. You've got characters named whatever. I mean, all the characters in there have a defining trait, which is their name. Uh, so... With the Pilgrim's Progress, it's a really obvious allegory. Lewis writing Alice in Wonderland is a more interesting example because his is not so obvious an allegory, and it's precisely because it's less obvious as an allegory that it has become kind of degraded over the years to be something that it never was. Nowadays, we you know see movies of Alice in Wonderland, the old Disney classic or the newer Disney movies, or you know, there's probably others besides the Disney versions, and they basically just end up being kind of weird, almost like acid trip, what what in the world's going on type stories that don't really have any direct point. And this is where it gets to the issue I'm getting at, because when you take that meaning out of Lewis Carroll's work and you ignore what he intended, the story doesn't make nearly as much sense. When you know what the story is really about and you understand the meanings that he was literally just forcing into these characters and how he was doing them in the story, you can understand everything much better. It's still a weird story, but it's meant to be weird because he thought of the politics at the time as being pretty weird um, in the sense that people would do things that the average person would just look at and go, that's unthinkable. So, you know, one of the examples of that is when the walrus and a... I forget who the walrus is with, but the, there's a walrus and there's another character and they're eating a bunch of clams or mussels or whatever it is, and there's a specific meaning to that. One of those characters, if I remember correctly, is Benjamin Disraeli, who was, I think at the time, the prime... not the prime... was it the prime minister or the speaker of the House of Commons? I forget. But the idea was the politicians are doing really bad things to the common people in ways that are not exactly obvious, but Lewis Carroll was trying to bring attention to that fact by publishing a satire. Take all that meaning out, and it just seems like a meaningless bunch of weird adventures that happen to a girl for who knows what reason. And so this is why I think we have to pay attention to the intent of the author, regardless of whether the author believed in authorial intent or anything else. Because at the end of the day, their intent is what defines the nature of the story in the first place, and there's only so far you can go without doing violence to the story if you start to ignore that. So, for example, and this is obviously an extreme example, I can't interpret The Lord of the Rings in such a way as to say that Galadriel was a brunette and Arwen was a blonde. The story tells us otherwise. That's a direct contradiction. But it's more than that. You can go to any number of different points in the story, and while there's things that any number of people could take out of it, taking any one of those ideas too far would be going too far. So, for example... Libertarians like to think of it as, you know, a screed against big government because Tolkien himself said that his political 
feelings lean toward anarchy, and the Shire is basically an anarchic system with virtually no government, you know, this sort of thing. But that doesn't mean that Tolkien was a, you know, an anarcho-libertarian, because I don't think he was, because in that same statement he said about anarchy, he also mentioned unconstitutional monarchy. He didn't want the idea, he didn't like the idea of control, people exerting control over, the, over other people, but that doesn't mean he doesn't think that government is necessary. Similarly, environmentalists like to look at the story and say that Tolkien was, you know, pro-environment, totally anti-industrial, thought everything should just remain as it is in nature. It's like, well, yes and no. I mean, you can take that only to a certain point. Tolkien didn't think man should never do anything with nature. He didn't like industrialization, but he had no problem per se with mills and other things which require, you know, chopping down trees and building buildings with. So, I mean, it, Tolkien, and this is consonant with the broader Christian and more specifically Catholic view, would have had the idea that man does have some dominion over nature and has the right to use nature, just not to abuse nature. And so some environmentalists would probably be on the same page as Tolkien, but some environmentalists are probably more radical than Tolkien, and they would be wrong to think that Tolkien is in their camp. So, to interpret this story as being purely a nature versus whatever, there's an aspect of that in the story, but that's not what it's all about, and it's not as extreme as some people would like to take it. So, those are some examples of what I mean by there's room to take lessons from the story, but you can't totally divorce it from the author's intent because then you start to mess with things in the story. When environmental issues come up in the story, there's never a statement or implication by Tolkien's characters that all use of, you know, machines or anything else is bad. You know, the hobbits use some machines, very simple ones, you know, the Treebeard doesn't like the fact that Gimli carries an axe, but he's not, you know, Treebeard isn't, he never expresses the opinion that the other races in Middle-earth have zero right to use trees either. I mean, it just never goes that far. So, that's why I think we still have to pay attention to the author's intent. It may not lock us down to one particular meaning, like an allegory would, but it still locks us down to a degree, and we have to respect that because if we go too far without respecting it, we end up changing the nature of the story itself. And at that point, you're no longer interpreting, you're just writing your own story. One example that I want to explore in some detail, just to give a really good example of how this works, is, and I've talked about this before in my response to, I think it was Wisecrack, in a video not too long ago, on their take on what changed between the book and the movies. And in there, they talked about the fact that Frodo, Aragorn, and Gandalf are like the priest, king, and prophet uh, roles of Christ and therefore represent Christ kind of in a way in, you know, Tolkien's story. And there are certainly aspects of all of that that fit that approach. And Wisecrack is far from the only you know, people who have come up with that idea. Uh, I believe Brad Berzer talks about the same idea in his book, The Sanctifying Myth, which is about Tolkien. There's probably others that I don't remember well enough right off the top of my head. But point being, there's certainly enough there in the story that you can get a lot of those parallels. Aragorn's role as the king returned, reestablishing the kingdom of Gondor and Arnor, that very neatly matches the idea of Christ coming in his second coming, setting up the kingdom and ruling and, you know, bringing about a utopia. And I don't use that term lightly. I mean, you know, more or less truly a utopia. Um, similarly, Gandalf does have a lot of attributes that make him kind of like a prophet. He is literally a messenger from the Valar, which is essentially like being a messenger from God you know, delivering their 
you know, assistance to the peoples of Middle Earth in speaking on their behalf. So that makes him very much like a prophet. Similarly, Frodo has a very priestly role in the sense that he is the one who, you know, makes the sacrifices which are needed to, you know, save the rest of Middle Earth. And that, in the Catholic view, is a lot like, you know, the presentation of the Eucharist and all these other things that priests do on a regular basis in church. So, certainly I think all of those ideas are present, but I don't think Tolkien was intentionally putting in there, you know, this threefold divine office thing so as to say, you know, this is Catholicism in a work of fiction. In fact, he was fairly careful to say there's no organized, this is all pre-Christian, there's really no organized religion, there's, you know, Tolkien was pretty hesitant about any of that working its way in. He didn't want Catholicism or any other organized religion to be there because the whole theory behind the world is that it's pre all of that. There is no revealed religion at that stage in history based on the way he's writing the stories. So even though those ideas are there, and certainly they're consonant with Tolkien's faith, I don't think it has anything to do with the meaning of the story or anything like that. It's a lot easier, and here we get back to the idea of applicability versus interpretation, it's a lot easier to take this and as an application than it is as an interpretation. And in, interpreting the story to mean this would be that the story is Catholic in a way that Tolkien denied. Tolkien said, yes, it's Catholic, but it's not a Christian myth. It's not about Christ. It's not a story about the Christian religion. And so to read Frodo, Aragorn, and Gandalf into these three roles and kind of make them into an amalgam that equals Jesus is that doesn't really work. And there's a number of levels on which it doesn't really work because Frodo, while he does in a way make sacrifices and you know, carries the ring to Mordor and casts it into the fire and how Aragorn does become king and restores a kingdom and all these other things. There are lots of areas where the story doesn't really fit that well. But the reason we see that in the story, even though Tolkien, I don't think, was intentionally trying to do this, is because Tolkien had these ideas and thought they were true and valuable. And so... From his perspective, Jesus, as you know, all three of these things, is the ideal type of these different things. And so from a Catholic point of view, what does a good king look like? A good king looks like Jesus. So if Tolkien is going to write a story with a good king, he's going to write a good king that looks kind of like Jesus in some way. And he also mentions in his uh, essay on fairy stories all really good fiction is really about mirroring the true great story, which he, you know, basically will say is, you know, not everybody understands the true great story, but to him, the Christian religion being true, the eucatastrophe, he even says this in, this in the essay, the eucatastrophe of human history is the incarnation and the resurrection is or was it the resurrection or the i think it was the resurrection is the is the eucatastrophe of the incarnation so he in his mind had the idea that all of human fiction to the extent that it does really well in some way mirrors the true human history which includes the incarnation and resurrection of Jesus. And so, naturally, if he thinks all stories are going to do that, it makes sense that his own stories would do that, whether consciously or not. He is going to write stories which, in his mind, make for good stories. And in his, his, his view, good stories are those which, in some way, reflect the true story. And so the true story in some way, is what he thinks himself and any other good fiction author is writing a form of.
not obviously doing the same thing over again. He's not writing an allegory of the incarnation and resurrection. That would be a Christian myth, which he denied his story was. But it makes sense, given that, that he's going to have elements of those aspects of the Christian faith in his stories, even if they're not in an explicit way. So you're going to see characters who do things like good prophets. You're going to see characters who do things like good priests. You're going to see characters who do thing like, things like good kings do. Because that's, you know, what we all do when we write fiction, really. If we write a hero, our hero is going to try to live up to what we think of as being the best ideals. So naturally those things are going to find their way into fiction. It just so happens that most people find similar things ideal. Tolkien thinks this is because they all reflect the Christian faith ultimately, but whether you take that view or not, the fact remains. Heroes tend to look similar for reasons. There's a reason tropes exist. Tropes are not all bad. They exist for a reason. That's why they're tropes. So this idea that we can interpret the story as being you know, Aragorn is Christ the king, Gandalf is Christ the prophet, Frodo is Christ the, the priest. No, we can't. We can't interpret it that way because the, the story doesn't work. There's no final end to, you know, human history there. There's no, I mean, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work on the level of that being Christ on his first visit in on earth and getting crucified because even though Frodo certainly does suffer a great deal, he doesn't die. He doesn't come back to life. Gandalf comes back to life, but that really doesn't fit either because that's a very different kind of death and resurrection. So it doesn't work as an interpretation, but we can see the applicability, and that's why it works. So that's an example of how to distinguish this, the ideas of interpretation and application and why they're different and why authorial intent actually helps us resolve that tension and show why the intent is important but it's not necessarily so controlling as it would be in the case of an allegory. So those are the reasons that I come down on the authorial intent side of authorial intent versus death of the author. If you want to take the death of the author approach you can knock yourself out. I'm just giving my opinion and where I fall on that line and ultimately, like I said, I think all communication, including fiction, is about the intent of the author or the speaker or whatever it is. Ultimately, that's just the way I see it. So that's my view. If you have different thoughts on the subject, if you want to add to my arguments, or if you have a counter argument that you think I haven't considered, put all that in the comments. Could be a really interesting discussion. If you want to follow me on Twitter at JRRT Lore, you can occasionally get some. Tolkien related trivia questions. You can also, of course, like the video and share it around if you thought it was a good one. Please also subscribe and hit that bell icon to get all the notifications. And I'm also on Odyssey and Rumble and have podcast versions of these videos as well. And finally, you can support me on Patreon. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namariye.